good afternoon. I'm uh, Professor Karina Lane at the University of Richmond um, School of Law, for those who don't know me. And it's my distinct honor to be introducing you to the esteemed Akhil Lamar who is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University uh, School of Law. So this is actually a harder job than one might think, doing the introduction. I mean, how do you distill a re resume that's like 25 pages long? Um, and that's the condensed version. So I'm going to keep it pretty short so that we can um, get Professor Amar up here, and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. But very briefly, uh, Akhil Amar joined the Yale faculty in 1985 at the age of 26. He is Yale's only professor to have won the university's unofficial triple crown, the Sterling Chair for Scholarship, the Devane Medal for Teaching, and the Lamar Award for Alumni Service. Akhil's um, uh, uh, work has won awards from, well, pretty much everyone. He has been cited by the Supreme Court in over 40 cases. He regularly testifies before Congress at the invitation of both parties, which is no small feat. And he is one of the top five most cited uh, constitutional law scholars. And I looked this up today, by the way, there's a new study out. He is in the top 20 most cited scholars of all time in all categories. He is a superstar. His uh, scholarship has been showcased on a gazillion podcasts, and he was the informal consultant for the popular TV show, The West Wing. I didn't know that. Um, he is the author of more than 100 law review articles and several books over the years. His books have won the Yale University Press Governor's Award, the ABA Silver Gavel Award. His 2012 book, America's Unwritten Constitution, was named one of the year's 100 best nonfiction books by the Washington Post in all categories. And his 2016 book, The Constitution Today, was named one of the year's top 10 nonfiction books by Time Magazine. His latest and most ambitious book, The Words That Made Us, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1760 to 1840, came out in May 2021. It is not a small book. Um, he tells me there is a sequel. I'm like, what? Um, uh, uh, and I'll tell you, when it came out, uh, my colleague and, and good friend, Kurt Lash, were talking and scheming about do you think we could get Akhil Amar to come to University of Richmond and give a book talk? Um, so, you know, thanks, thank, thanks to my partner there for helping um, behind the lines. But I give you a renowned legal scholar and a dear friend, Akhil Amar. It's such an honor to be back here. I see. My friend Kurt, thank you so much, Karina, for that. Um, all you have to do is ask. I will always come here. This is one of my favorite places. And, and I have so many fond memories. And, um, and truthfully, I just, I, I'm so happy to, to be anywhere, uh, frankly, because we're in person. And I've missed this. Um, um, when you write a book, you kind of fantasize about being on book tour and actually talking about your ideas with people. And then, you see, we had COVID, and I haven't been able to do that. So this is really kind of the first time I'm able to see people, and uh, uh, rather than just Zoom, um, to talk about this book that, um, yes, means a lot to me. It's my most ambitious book. Um, it is long, but it, I hope it's, um, people have said it's quite readable. And you'll be the, the judges. I'm going to read to you from the last chapter. Um, the, the book is the first of three volumes. It's called The Words That Made Us, and it's a pun. Um, words that made the US. We're deeply divided now, and I think we need to come together as an us. And I try to tell a story. It's an honest story. I, I, I tell the bad stuff as well as um, the inspiring stuff. I, I am an American exceptionalist. Um, um, but I tell the story of how we, became a we, how America, uh, uh, New Worlders became Americans. Uh, um, and the subtitle of this one is America's Constitutional Conversation. We did that by talking with each other. We talked ourselves into existence as a people. 
um, newspapers and, and pamphlets and, and debates um, and cartoons and political theater and, and, and a, a robust, uninhibited, wide open discourse of, of every sort uh, makes us um, a we. And the subtitle of this one is America's Constitutional Conversation. It's all about conversation, 1760 to 1840. So it's the first four score, to borrow a phrase, years. Um, volume two will be the words that made us equal, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1840 to 1920. And oh, in that one, I'm going to be using Professor Lash's work again and again and again because you know he's given uh, us all amazing access to some of the primary sources from that period, the, the, especially the, the Civil War Reconstruction period, the, the second founding, the new birth of freedom. And volume three will be called um, The Words That Made Us Modern, America's Constitutional Conversation, 1920 to 2000. So if God gives me enough years, that's the project. Um, and I'm going to read to you um, from the last chapter of this, um, and then we'll have a conversation. The last chapter, um, it, it's a little bit morbid in a way. It's called Adieus um, to God. Um, and um, I bring some of the major, my major characters. This is, it, it, the, the book is about, in significant part, the great men of the early period. But they're great men created by a society. Uh, democratically, bottom up. So it's about by acclamation. It's about many things, but by acclamation, uh, the acclamation, the six um, found, uh, 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 most notable founders are our first four presidents: Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, um, plus Franklin and Hamilton. Um, and they disagreed about things. They worked together, and then they were cross purposes. And it's it's you know, and and what it means to be an American is to know that story in part. Um, and uh, in my last chapter, so it's chronological. I start the story a little bit earlier than most folks, 1760. I take it up to 1840. And in that last decade, um, the last of the, the initial founders passes from the scene. It's going to be a new generation after that. But in this last chapter, it's very cinematographic. It's like a, a movie of a certain sort. Um, um, uh, so um, in my last chapter, I bring my big characters back on stage. Um, one last time and kill them all off. Um, and um, so that's this chapter. Um, it's a little bit like Hamlet, you know, the last scene of Hamlet or something when just the stage is littered. Um, None of America's greatest founders composed a grand letter to his countrymen on his deathbed. Still, Americans searching for implicit farewell messages did not have far to look. Franklin went first. He died as he had lived, trying to better himself in the world. He was always tinkering, always inventing, always self-improving. He believed in progress, and he saw both himself and his country as works in progress. Some of his progressive ideas involved science and technology, the lightning rod, bifocals, the Franklin stove. Other progressive ideas were more social and political, a lending library, a volunteer fire company, philosophical society, a non-sectarian university, the intercolonial Albany plan. In 1787, just days before the start of the Grand Federal Convention, Franklin accepted the presidency of the world's first notable abolition society. Now, I've already just told you something amazing, you know, notwithstanding what Anna Nicole Jones in 1619 are telling you. America is the home of the world's first abolition society. The ain't, all societies pretty much in the world had slavery or unfreedom of some sort or other and had the idea of freeing slaves, like Ben-Hur, if you've seen that, or if you incline instead toward comedy, a funny thing happened on the way to the form, slaves becoming free. Okay? But only America, actually, in 1775, um, started championing and creating organizations, championing the idea that slavery should end everywhere, abolition, not just emancipation or manumission. Okay? So I've already told you something, actually, pretty big. Um, Franklin had bought and owned slaves earlier in his life. Doubtless influenced by his Quaker surroundings, but also moved by enlightenment philosophy, common sense, and grand strategy, he eventually came to see that slavery was wrong, that it should end, and that America should lead the way. Knowing that death was near, he decided that within America, he himself should lead the way and make abolition his last great cause, his last gift 
to America and the world. As president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society, Franklin signed a petition in early 1790 that reached Congress on February 12, 1790. Exactly 19 years later, a magic number for Thomas Jefferson, he thought every constitution should, should evaporate every 19 years. Exactly to the day, 19 years later, Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin would be born See, on the same day. A, a multiple coincidence about moral and scientific progress that surely would have delighted Franklin. So arguably the two greatest figures of the 19th century, Abraham Lincoln in politics, Charles Darwin in science, February 12th, 1809, same day, exactly 19 years after Franklin introduces this anti-slavery petition. So how cool is that? Franklin's petition was direct and earnest. This was one side of Franklin. Paraphrasing the Declaration of Independence on whose drafting committee Franklin had served, the petition proclaimed that, quote, mankind are all formed by the same almighty being and, be and equally designed for the enjoyment of happiness. Equal liberty was originally the portion and is still the birthright of all men, unquote. From these basic premises flowed the petition's conclusion and prayer for relief. Congress should, quote, remove this inconsistency from the character of the American people and step to the very verge of power vested in you for discouraging every species of traffic in the persons of our fellow men, unquote. Congressmen from the Deep South raged at the very idea of even discussing slavery. Georgians and South Carolinians insisted that even consideration and discussion of the issue was, quote, unconstitutional and tending to injure some of the states in the Union, unquote. When this extremist gambit failed, Georgia's representative, James Jackson, returned to center stage to defend American slavery with a flurry of arguments. America's economic development required slave labor, he said. Blacks were suited for the work that needed, to be, uh, they needed doing and climates that were unhealthy for whites. If, American, if America refrained from using slaves in such land, Spain would fill the vacuum and in a short period dominate various lucrative markets. It was immensely preferable, that's a quote, um, to be a slave in America than to remain in Africa. Once freed, blacks would be unable to intermingle and intermarry with most whites who would not want to associate with them or help create a motley breed of mixed race offspring. Sending blacks to Africa was impracticable. Custom and habit deserved respect. The Bible blessed slavery. Franklin countered with a lovely satire in the press. This was another side of Franklin. This would turn out to be his very last journalistic piece and it poetically recalled his very first journalistic hoax when as a teenage lad, he had puckishly posed as a middle-aged matron, silence, do good. And those of you who have seen National Treasure will remember that scene, of course. Franklin likewise published his 1790 parody under a pen name, but no one who knew him could miss his signature style and sly wit. The piece pretended to be an earnest letter to the editor, telling readers about a 1687 debate among Algerian Muslims concerning their customary practice of enslaving European Christians. And here's the, the, the block quote. Reading last night in your excellent newspaper the speech of Mr. Jackson in Congress against their meddling in the affair of slavery or attempting to mend the con uh, condition of slaves, it put me in mind of a similar one made about 100 years ago since by uh, uh, Sidi Ibrahim, a member of the Dewan of Algiers. It was against granting the petition of the sect called Erika, or purists who prayed for the abolition of piracy and slavery as being unjust. Mr. Jackson does not quite quote it uh, in his eloquent speech, um, uh, despite its surprising similarity. The African speech, as translated, is as follows, and then this is a quote. Have these Erica considered the consequences of granting their petition? If we cease our piratic cruises against the Christians, how shall we be furnished with the commodities which are so necessary for us? If we forbear to make slaves of their people, who in this hot climate are to cultivate our lands? Must we not then be our own slaves? And is there not more compassion and more favor due to us as Muslims than, the, to, than to, the, to these Christian dogs? And if we set our slaves free, what is to be done with them? Few of them will return to their countries. They know too well the great hardships they must be subject to there. They will not embrace our holy religion. They will not adopt our manners. Our people will not pollute themselves by intermarrying with them. And what is there so pitiable in their present condition? Were they not slaves in their own countries? 
Is their condition then made worse by their falling into our hands? No, here they are brought into a land where the sun of Islam gives forth its light and shines in full splendor. And they have an opportunity to make themselves acquainted with the true religious doctrine, thereby saving their immortal souls. How grossly are they mistaken in imagining slavery to be disallowed by Quran? Are not two precepts to quote no more? Quote, masters, treat your slaves with kindness. Slaves, serve your masters with cheerfulness and fidelity. Clear proofs to the contrary? Of course, Franklin's tongue-in-chief topsy-turvy reversed everything, a classic satirical move. In his alternative universe, dark-skinned Africans who deemed themselves racially and culturally superior were enslaving light-skinned European folk. Christians were the slaves, not the masters. The Erica, the phonetic, the phonetic ending syllables of America, were almost, an almost anagram of the Quakers. The scriptural passages came not as claimed from Quran, rather they were the very biblical text that Representative James Jackson from Georgia had himself quoted. Franklin's spoof ran in the March 25, 1790 issue of Philadelphia's Federal Gazette. Less than a month later, he was dead at age 84. And his countrymen began to see with hindsight the special significance of the words he likely knew were his last. His playful piece was also deadly serious. They were his dying words to America. By pretending to excavate the past, Franklin's farewell message was in fact inviting his fellow Americans to envision the future. How would the Constitution's project appear to posterity in 1887, a hundred years after the Grand Philadelphia Convention, if America as a whole did not change course and move, move toward abolition, as his own Pennsylvania had already done in 1780, would the nation's continuing embrace of slavery and its hodgepodge of Jacksonian rationalizations one day come to be seen as every bit as twisted and despotic as Franklin's fictional Algerians of 1687? Franklin and Washington were America's two greatest founding figures. And it's remarkable that Washington's de facto farewell message, when he passed away in 1799 at his Mount Vernon home, was so similar in substance, though not at all in tone, to Franklin's parting soliloquy. Metaphorically, both men died with abolition and emancipation on their lips. Rosebud. Now, for most of them, Kurt, they, don't, they have no idea what Rosebud means. But that was this movie, Citizen Kane, that you should check out. I know it's black and white, but still. Franklin envisioned virtuous public action. Congress should pass laws freeing all slaves. Washington embodied virtuous private action. Slaveholders should take actions freezing their own slaves, just as he was doing on his deathbed. deathbed. Franklin championed abolition as a public petitioner and journalist. Washington affected manumission as a private manager and planter. Franklin was hoping for a complete official end of slavery, abolition, something like the later 13th Amendment. Washington offered freedom for individual existing slaves and hoped others would follow suit, manumission, his own miniature emancipation proclamation. Washington was not garrulous in life, nor was he so in death. He did not compose another elaborate formal farewell message to his countrymen. Rather, this most private of public men sent a public message via his private choices in his last will and testament. His favorite slave and companion, William Lee, won instant emancipation, and more than 100 other slaves that Washington owned would soon walk free. Quote, it is my will and desire that all slaves which I hold in my own right shall receive their freedom." Unquote. Through no fault of Washington's, hundreds of other Mount Vernon slaves lay beyond his testamentary decree. He had no legal authority to free the Mount Vernon slaves whom Martha had inherited from her first husband, Daniel Park Custis. By law, these dower slaves did not belong to George, nor did they even fully belong to Martha. They had to go to Martha Custis's heirs, who had no blood relation to George um, after, her de um, um, after her death. Actions proverbially speak louder than words, and in life, Washington had been a man of action. So in death, as in much of his life, as an entrepreneur, as a general, as president, Washington in his testamentary actions was a model of careful preparation, sacrifice, even secrecy. In his will, he made substantial financial provision for his free slaves, freed slaves as required by both prudence and Virginia law. 
He had scraped together enough to do this thanks to years of careful financial planning and penny pinching. He had kept his manumission plan quiet, not even telling Martha, much as years earlier he had kept his Yorktown plan quiet until the last push. Success sometimes required stealth. Washington's characteristic firmness and serious of purpose shone through in the stern prose of his last will and testament. Quote, and I do moreover, most pointedly and most solemnly enjoin it upon my executors to see this clause respecting slaves and every part of it thereof be religiously fulfilled at the epoch when, into which it is directed to take place without evasion, neglect, or neglect, delay after the crops which may then have been, be, be on the ground have been harvested particularly as it respects the aged and infirm. Um, as, um, as Washington's fame had grown, he too had grown. As he became more and more extraordinary in the eyes of the world, he came to demand more of himself, unlike, say, Jefferson. In his early years, Washington had not been exceptionally thoughtful or self, uh, um, or so, uh, or self-critical slaveholder. He took slavery for granted. It was the way of the world, the way things always had been. He was not gratuitously cruel, but he was stern and cold, and he worked his slaves hard. If they shirked, he had them flogged. If they fled, he had them caught and sold. As time passed, he became increasingly uncomfortable with slavery. He vowed to stop buying slaves and resolve not to break, them, uh, break apart slave families on auction blocks. He told his private correspondents that he hoped slavery might somehow end, and he was open to ideas about how to do this. Re um, uh, revolutionary talk in the 1780s obliged Washington to rethink the premises of his upbringing. If all men truly were created equal, with unalienable rights of life, liberty, um, and happiness, then in the end, the revolution became more than talk. In light of all the other revolutionary changes <clears throat> that he himself had sparked as much as anyone in the world, why shouldn't he spark additionally revolutionary changes by reputing the most obvious form of tyranny still left? Between 1775 and 1797, Washington spent more than a dozen years living in the North as a general and president with anti-slavery whites and blacks all around him. Inwardly, he yearned to be a great man. The world increasingly thought of him as a great man. After 1783, many openly called him the greatest man in the world. How he came to think quietly, could such a man as himself die without making some sort of anti-slavery statement? What would Lafayette think? What would the French think? What would his fellow countrymen think? And what would posterity think? For if he was indeed the father of his country, then all future Americans were his children, his progeny, his posterity. What would they think of him? It's us. Much as the Philadelphia drafters, led of course by Washington himself, had laced the document with democratic sweeteners in anticipation of the democratic ratification process that lay ahead, so now Washington self-consciously thought about the future democratic ratification process that would determine his own enduring reputation and fame. Would future Americans continue to say, yes, we do, when asked to honor him and his memory, if he did nothing to reduce the large remaining stain on his good name? Thus, we today should think especially carefully about Washington's death and his personal emancipation proclamation, because in all this, he was surely thinking of us. Now I'm going to skip Hamilton's death, um, uh, because I only have so much time, and I want you to read the book. Um, the book is dedicated to several people, um, one of whom is Lynn manuel Miranda, one of whom is his spouse, Vanessa Nadal, uh, one of whom is Ron Chernow, the author of the Hamilton a great Hamilton biography, uh, one of whom is Neil Katyal, who introduced me um, to them all, one of whom is an extraordinary Virginian, happens to be Muslim, Kaiser Khan, um, who is a gold star father. But, but, um, so don't think, because I'm skipping over Hamilton, that um, I'm not um, a fanboy, both of Hamilton um, or of Lynn Miranda, because I am. But I only have so much time. 
and I'm here in Virginia, so I'm going to emphasize the Virginians. And I've told you already about um, Washington, so I'm going to end now. And I, and I won't tell you about Madison, um, but I'm going to end, of course, with um, Jefferson and Adams. What should we make of the most famous duel, D-U-A-L, not D-U-E-L, because I just told you about the most famous D-U-E-L death. What should we make of the most famous D-U-A-L death in American history? The passing away of frenemies, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, on the same day, within hours of each other, and their homes far apart. The most important facts that require analysis hide in plain view. What's amazing is people haven't seen what's the, the obvious takeaway here, you know, until I come along. Okay. Um, um, it at first seems preposterously improbable that these two men would die as they did. Not just on the same day, not just with one mentioning the other in his dying breath, even though, of course, they had not been in instantaneous contact. There was no email back then or the internet. Um, not just on the anniversary of their most famous joint venture, the Declaration of Independence, but on precisely the silver anniversary, the 50th birthday of the United States of America, of which they had both presided. If this were a novel, it would be ridiculed as infinitely too pat. The odds against such a confluence um, of coincidence seem a million to one. But this confluence was not freakish in the way that, say, a previously unknown geyser briefly and harmlessly erupting on the outskirts of Philadelphia, beginning precisely at high noon, July 4, 1826, would be virtually impossible to explain except as a sign from God. The Adams and Jefferson deaths involved human agency, human willpower. The coincidence wore two faces, public and private. On the private side, each, taking each man separately, we can only marvel at the strength of will involved. Each man died knowing the date, waiting for it, and then expiring precisely on cue like a great stage actor. Jefferson famously said, this is the fourth, or words to that effect. There's no record of his saying in each of the preceding days, this is the 30th, or this is the first, or this is the second, or this is the third. Each man willed himself to make it to the fourth. And then each sought natural release on that day, and indeed willed it. No hemlock was involved. This was not the death of Socrates. Rather, each man let go and desperately wanted to end on the fourth, and not say the fifth or the sixth. There would be far less glory on any other day, earlier or later. Jefferson had, in fact, taken um, opium, uh, opiate, uh, um, the opiate um, laudanum in the preceding days, and refused any more drugs once he thought he made it to the fourth. In fact, his last recorded words were, no doctor, nothing more. Jefferson's protege, James Monroe, also managed to die on July 4th, exactly five years later, 1831. Nearly five years after that, in 1836, Madison found himself on death's door in late June, but he refused the drugs that might have gotten him to the fourth, dying instead on June 28th. Of course, June July 4th was a less meaningful date for Madison. He had not been in Philadelphia in 1776. What kind of person is able to die on cue? Only a person of extraordinary will, with an eye on history and an astonishing drive to be remembered and celebrated in a certain way. The leading founder sought acclaim above all. The love of fame was, in the words of Hamilton's Federalist Number 72, quote, the ruling passion of the noblest minds, unquote. If America's great founders died on cue like actors, that's precisely because they were actors of a certain sort, intensely aware of their public audience. Thus, Adams and Jefferson each aimed to die on a key American date, not a personal one, not a special birthday or wedding anniversary, not the death date of a beloved soulmate or a favorite parent or child. Each privately aimed for an American date connected to his greatest public moment, his involvement in midwifing the birth of America itself. Um, um, for Jefferson, the de but, but, but the, the declaration meant different things, you see, to these two men. For Jefferson, the Declaration was all about its soaring words, words that he, uh, as a proud wordsmith, had largely composed, and its grand ideas about revolution and free and independent states. He was a, basically a proto-Confederate. Um, Jefferson Davis was aptly named. 
Um, in fact, the Constitution had repudiated this last idea of, of, of state sovereignty in the strongest form. Um, pro, um, Jefferson never understood this, because he was off in France, you see, at the time, chasing women and drinking wine. Um, he was, um, as has been, now been seen, an intensely willful man. And he could not see what he would not see, just as in the end he could not die on any day other than the day of his choice. Jefferson's attachment to the Declaration, a sense of special authorship of it, is the unmistakable message of his gravesite inscription, instructions for which he had composed well before July 1826. On the face of, and this is from his uh, diary, on the face of the obelisk, the following inscription, and not a word more, quote, here was Barry Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence of the Statue of Virginia for Religious Freedom and Father of the, United States, uh, the University of Virginia. Because by these, as testimonials, I have lived and I wish to be most remembered. Note that there's not a word in these instructions or in the final obelisk about the Constitution or about Jefferson's service under the Constitution, the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, or the third President for that matter. Jefferson wanted to be remembered because of the Declaration and wanted the Declaration itself remembered above all else. How perfect it would be if he could make it to the Silver Fourth. How imperfect it would be if he lasted past that day. His death plan was thus set long before the Silver Fourth, as was his gravestone inscription. To be sure, the gravestone itself was not yet inscribed, but the plan to carve it in stone, to carve in stone, his reference to the Declaration, was indeed already metaphorically carved in stone. Adams' death on July 4th, 1826, shows that he too was a man of truly extraordinary will and inner strength, every bit as able as Jefferson to live as long as he had to and then die on a dime for fame. Indeed, Adams had to make it past his 90th birthday, whereas Jefferson perished at age 83. For many years, perhaps, John Adams was living just to die in just the right way. My God, what, what kind of people are these? But there were obvious differences between the two men who seemed to die in perfect harmony. Adams was obsessed by Jefferson, but not vice versa. Jefferson made no recorded mention of Adams at or near the end, whereas Adams' last words were, Thomas Jefferson still survived. Survives. In fact, Jefferson had predeceased Adams by a matter of hours, though, of course, there was no way for Adams to have possibly known this fact, given the time it took for news to travel. There is something oddly, there's something oddly apt. I'm, I'm about four minutes from conclusion. There's something oddly apt in old Adams' last words. And one aspect of that aptness is that old Adams was, in fact, wrong. As was seen in my first chapter, you know, old Adams in his declining years often got things wrong, but wrong in ways that nonetheless were then and remain today deeply revealing. What then was so significant about the false line about Jefferson? First, with this reference, Adams wanted his collaboration with Jefferson remembered. Adams had once been a team player. He lost that skill as he aged. But his partnership with Jefferson in 1776 was indeed among his greatest moments. Second, even as Adams died with a revealing rosebud on his lips, Jefferson. The error in his reference should remind us that he and Jefferson were not quite in sync. There was friendship in Adams' dying breath, but also rivalry. The two men were emphatically not peas in a pod, even though they were together in 1776 and died together and apart exactly 50 years later. They were not best friends, even if Adams said so and believed it so. They were, at best, intensely rivalrous friends, frenemies, we would say today. The two in death wanted America to remember entirely different things. Jefferson wanted the words and the state sovereignty principles of the Declaration of Independence remembered. Adams wanted Adams remembered. The fact that he and Jefferson had been in the room when it happened, that's a really Lynn Miranda reference, um, when even Washington was not in the room, um, when even Washington wasn't in the room, when, when Patrick Henry wasn't in the room, and, uh, um, and Je um, Jefferson wasn't in the room, and no one had yet heard of a boy, old Adams' word, oft repeated, named Hamilton. He was obsessed, you know, that they were, they're thinking about Hamilton. He was just a boy in 1776. It says, old Adams' compulsive need to see himself 
as and to be remembered as Jefferson's friend began long before 1826. In late 1809, Adams wrote a jaw-dropping letter to Benjamin Rush, himself a declaration signer and a friend of both Adams and Jefferson. Indeed, the man who brokered the famous epistolary rapprochement between the two ex-presidents in their final years. According to Adams' 1809 missive, quote, there has never been the smallest interruption of the personal friendship between me and Mr. Jefferson that I know of. You should remember that Jefferson was but a boy to me. I was at least 10 years older than him in age and more than 20 years older than him in politics. I'm bold to say I was his preceptor in, public, in politics and taught him everything that's been good and solid in his whole political conduct." Unquote. The inaccuracies and self-delusions of this passage are mind-boggling. Never the smallest interruption of friendship. Adams boycotted Jefferson's presidential inauguration, C.F. Trump. Before, Adam, before that, Adams signed into law a sedition act that criminalized Jefferson's subsequent collusion with James Callender and clandestine, clandestine authorship of the Kentucky uh, Resolutions. More than 20 years older politically, Adams scribbled his first private notes on the risk of assistance episode in 1761 and anonymously published his first notable writings on the imperial crisis in late 1765. Jefferson won election to the House of Burgesses in 1769 and was thus a prominent lawmaker before, even before you know, he had even heard of Adams, who first openly set foot on a continental stage in the Boston Massacre trial in late 1770, defending British soldiers. Taught him everything? Funny that Jefferson never said anything like that. In 1822, in response to a Fourth of July address by an earnest youngster, Adams went even further. Quote, Jefferson and Adams, it's like the third person, like Bob Dole talking about Bob Dole. Jefferson and Adams were never rivals. It was Hamilton that was the rival of Jefferson. Never even rivals? What an odd view of the election of 1800. <laughs> In the end, it was Hamilton who pushed the Federalist House to pick Jefferson, while Adams sulked in his tent. Old Adams felt humiliated by his 1800 loss to Jefferson, and these deep feelings of humiliation generated a complex psychic response. If Jefferson really was always his friend and indeed pupil, he really hadn't entirely lost quite. He had simply passed the baton. By late 1809, Jefferson himself had passed the baton to Madison, and old Adams was beginning to think about what might happen next. Donald Jr. Oh, excuse me. Um, unlike other leading founding fathers, old Adams had a son and namesake, John Quincy. Perhaps John Quincy himself could be president, but only if old Adams made lasting peace with the Virginia dynasty and with Jefferson in particular, who himself had been a father figure and mentor to the boy John Quincy back in Paris in the late 1780s. Uh, in the 1780s, excuse me. Maybe John Adams could indeed win a second, even third, term vicariously through John Quincy. He whose son wins last, laughs best. When old Adams died, his son was indeed in the executive mansion. If Jefferson still lived, in fact he did not, perhaps, old Adams dreamed, the great Virginian could help John Quincy in 1828 against the military madman Donald Trump, against the military madman Andrew Jackson. For all of his unreliability, for all the unreliability of old Adams' claims, there is still deep truth lurking in all the falsity, just as there was in old Adams' tales about young Otis, that's chapter one of the book. Adams and Jefferson had not dined alone in 1776. They had dined together and worked together, along with others, of course. And amazingly, they died just as they had lived, together in a way, but also apart. And I'm not going to tell you about Madison's death, but oh, it's interesting too. And I promise you, you'll like the Hamilton stuff too, but you'll just have to read the book. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got, I hope, some time for questions, right? I haven't filibustered too much. I filibustered a lot, but, but yeah, we, we have some time. And by the way, Kurt, I just am getting a text from a former student of mine who just tells me 
I'm so happy um, that everything worked out. I, I can't thank you enough for all your advice and support. I just, he just accepted um, a, 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 a position, you know, just like, and I remember, uh, Kurt, when, when you got your first offer and how happy you were, Wh whatever happened to you? You know, <laughs> um, but um, so so uh, anyway, so that that that's poignant for me that that just was coming through. In case you heard the buzzing in my my cell phone, that was a, a former student who just got a teaching job at a at a at a great place, perfect position for him. Um, actually, Hamilton's alma mater, uh, Columbia. Um, okay, what do you want to ask me? Ah, Mr. Taft, Stephen Taft, was it? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, um, given that Jefferson uh, expressed a lot of reservations about slavery during his life, perhaps more publicly than Washington did, um, and give, I mean, given that he wouldn't have, have lost anything personally by um, uh, freeing them upon his death, and he was also bankrupt, so it wouldn't make much difference anyway, um, uh, why do you think he neglected to do that? So, if you had met me, I know where I am. I, 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 and and to get here, I have to go along things like the Jefferson Davis Highway and pass, you know, Stonewall Jackson's death site and burial site. And I'm not sure on the burial if it's you know the whole body or just the arm or whether the arm was ever actually you know um, reunited with, with with the rest. So I understand where I am. Um, but here's actually what I say about Jefferson. So if you had met me. Um, at age 20, I would have told you, oh, if I'm ever lucky enough, if God ever, you know, to have a son, you know, if God ever gives me a son, um, I'm going to name him Jefferson. Okay. And, um, and I spent a lifetime now studying these folks. And they sometimes agreed, and they sometimes disagreed, and sometimes you have to choose. Because if Madison is right on the bank, Hamilton's wrong. And if Hamilton's right on the bank, Madison's wrong. Hamilton's right on the bank. And by the way, if Madison early on is right on the bank, then he's wrong later on when he changes his mind and signs into law. And John Marshall is wrong when he upholds it. And the unanimous Supreme Court is wrong when they uphold it. And five of the seven people on that court are appointed by Jefferson and Madison. Okay? So sometimes you have to choose. And um, so um, um, I'll tell you what I begin to say. About. So um, in this book, I say the greatest by far um, uh, uh, among them is George Washington. He's literally in every other way, head and shoulders above everyone else. And Franklin's pretty impressive, but he dies you know, very early. Um, Hamilton is Washington's right hand from beginning to end. Madison and Jefferson betray Washington, and Jefferson never understands, in fact, the Constitution because he's not there. And he and Madison get worse and worse and worse um, as life goes on, even as Washington and Franklin get better and better. So I wouldn't name my son Jefferson. Uh, uh, thank goodness I didn't. I named him after my brother. Um, um, and I told my brother, OK, don't screw up, because I'm not having you mess up this name for, you know, for, for, for my boy. Um, and, and Vic, my brother, has not screwed up. I'm very proud of him, and, and, I, and, and, I, and I love him deep. He's actually my son's name for both of my, my brothers. OK. So um, I'm an old guy now. And here's what I'm telling you. You can't change the past. Made a lot of mistakes, but you can change the future in some of you. So deep question, do you get better over time, or do you get worse? I've just told you Franklin got better. Washington gets better. Jefferson and Madison get worse. They need to form a political party because John Adams has made it a crime to criticize John Adams. You know, Vladimir Putin makes it a crime to criticize Vladimir Putin. Donald Trump wanted it to be a crime to criticize Donald Trump. This is not good. Um, so I understand they have to create a political party to defeat John Adams. But once they create that political party, that's a beast that needs to be fed, and they feed it. And it has a southern base. And if they were alive today, their names would be Kevin McCarthy and not Liz Cheney, whose mother writes a biography of Madison, in fact, by the way. So they create a political party that has slavery at its rotten core. And as life goes on, they get worse and worse and worse 
on slavery publicly and privately. And that's what happens if you're a party person above all. Okay? Um, so that's the story that I tell. And, and Washington renounces them in, in his years of retirement, does not exchange a single letter with them. And I'm with Washington. And, and he grows increasingly close to Hamilton. Um, and Jefferson has deep character flaws. Um, and, he's, and he's a great poet, and he soars, and you listen to him. But he's actually, um, well, here's how I begin my introduction of Hamilton. This is halfway, M. F. Jefferson, halfway into the book, page 414. And remember, this is not how I started. I was going to name my son after him. People lie. Politicians lie more than most. And Thomas Jefferson lied more than most politicians. He lied to his friends. He lied to his constituents. He lied to Washington, and he lied to himself. Thomas Jefferson was also undeniably one of America's most important founders. At his best, he championed principles of freedom at the very foundation of America's constitutional conversation. As president, he achieved one of America's greatest diplomatic and geostrategic triumphs, the Louisiana Purchase. Flanked by James Madison, he also created an extraordinary conversational machine, a national political party backed by a national newspaper network that dominated American politics for six decades. Jefferson's tendency to dissemble had deep roots. In personal conversation, he valued politesse, politeness. Above all, um, he considered an enlightenment virtue. He avoided unpleasant confrontation and face-to-face -face disagreement, and thus often left listeners believing he had agreed with them when, in fact, he did not. Adams, by contrast, cherished and embodied candor and honesty above all. Jefferson, uh, Hamilton, too, was far more direct in head-on encounters. So st Hamilton will never stab you in the back. He'll stab you in the front. Um, so um, I explained that Jefferson had offsetting flaws. Um, um, he had actually a lot of screwy ideas. Um, not a few, a lot. But thankfully, he was a hypocrite. And so when actually he was in power uh, and, and he was confronted with these screw ideas, he didn't apply them against them. So who's present 19 years after the Constitution? Well, that would be Thomas Jefferson. And gone is all talk about you know, the thing poofing into you know, um, uh, at, at, the, at the stroke of midnight or something. Um, uh, so he gets, he becomes, as a young man, he says, we should get rid of slavery everywhere. As an old man, he's opposing limits on the extension of slavery. Um, the, 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 that's the Missouri Compromise of, of 1820. James Madison is saying the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional, which is the same bullshit that Roger Tawney will pronounce in Dred Scott, that it's actually illegal to, to prohibit slavery in the church. That's preposterous. These are the people that. Jefferson authors the Northwest Ordinance that actually prohibits slavery in words you know, in, uh, that will actually become the words of the 13th Amendment. Kurt is nodding his head. And James Madison gets it through the first Congress. And they abandon all that because they actually have to feed the party base. Kevin McCarthy, read this book. OK? I, the, 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 the pub dated this book, I actually did an event at AEI Two hours before I did my book event, Liz Cheney and Paul Ryan um, 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 crossed the Rubicon on Trump. Same event. Um, um, so, and you can agree with her or disagree with her, but she's not putting party above all else. This is a problem. You believe the other party's bad, it's evil, um, and you ha it has to be defeated. But when you put your party above everything, Kurt and I love Abraham Lincoln. He is a party man, but the, his party is not quite corrupt. It will become corrupt, it will become the party of Grant and McKinley and Railroads and Lochner and, and not actually a champion of um, uh, uh, Friedman and, and uh, of the Bill of Rights. So, oh, you got to read the book because everything that you know about these people may not be right. And I'm going to, so I say the idea that the, it's Mad, the Madison is the father of the Constitution is preposterous. It's just embarrassing. Washington is the father of the Constitution. People vote for it because it's Washington. He's the unanimously selected presiding officer. People vote for it because, actually, he's going to be the first president. He's unanimously selected president. He's unanimously re-elected president. No one, that would be true of no one else. Madison succeeds only when he works with Washington and not thereafter. Washington empowers 
Jefferson to be a Secretary of State and Hamilton to be a Secretary of the Treasury. It's Washington, you know, from, from uh, the beginning to end. None of Madison's distinctive ideas actually prevail at Philadelphia, none of them that are genuinely Madison's ideas. No one pays any attention whatsoever to the Federalist Number 10 at the founding over the first 130 years thereafter. I give you all the evidence for, for, for this. If you had a good argument for why you'd vote for the Constitution, why would you wait to your 10th op-ed to make it? You wouldn't, you see. The important Federalist papers are the ones that Hamilton writes early on, which are the following, unite or die, which is Benjamin Franklin's idea. Because if we don't form an indivisible union, um, we will actually be speaking Russian or German or French or Spanish or English, but it's going to be the Queen's English. Because you know what happens to small little places? They, like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, you know, um, um, Ukraine, they get gobbled up by thugs and tyrants. That's the argument that would persuade an ordinary American why you actually need to create an indivisible union. And it's not Madison's argument in the Federal Senate, which is brilliant. It's worthy of tenure. It's a really interesting idea, but it doesn't actually persuade anyone and doesn't begin to prevail until the era that Kurt actually um, uh, spotlights, the Reconstruction era, when we're going to actually have a Bill of Rights applicable against states, which Madison wants from the beginning. He's far-sighted, but he, it, he's, and that's why you should read, for example, Kurt's piece on how actually, oh, the um, religion clauses actually change their meaning um, in the reconstruction process. But so, so I'm in my panth, because yes, what do we have in common? We Americans. Because the answer is not race, not ethnicity, not religion or lack thereof. N not even language, truthfully, all, you know, totally in terms of you know, first language. Um, I bet some members of Kurt's family may not have actually spoken um, English as their first language. They may not have. He's nodding his head. Okay. So what do we have in common? And, and some of our ancestors came hundreds of years ago, and some people's families came last year, and some came with bullwhips, and some came in chains. What we have in common is our constitution, our institutions, the presidency is the same thing that it was in, you know, plus or minus in George Washington's day, you know, through Lincoln and, and Franklin Roosevelt and, and Ronald Reagan and, 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 and today. We have our institutions, we have our, our sacred texts like the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. We have certain principles that we're dedicated to, and, you know, um, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Um, and we do have actually our icons, our, our, our heroes, our fathers. They're not my fathers, but I can, I can adopt them. I can choose to become a total American, and I have, and you can too. Oh, but now we're going to actually have to talk about them because they didn't all agree on everything. And in my rendering, you're going to have to decide whether you're a Washington man or a Madison man on, on, on the Bank of the United States or on a carriage tax or on all sorts of things. So in my ranking, Washington and Franklin actually rank pretty high. Washington above all. Hamilton moves up. Lynn Miranda was on to something, as was Ron Chernow. And they were anti-slavery, um, uh, basically. And, and Jefferson and Madison, actually, the, who are also Virginians, moved up. But you, my fellow, you know, my, my, you know, my Virginians, you can't you know, um, embrace both Washington and um, Madison Jefferson across the board because they were at cross purposes and you're going to have to choose choose Washington and he's not perfect I told you but he gets better they get worse Jefferson cares too much about wine women and song and himself he's not allowed to actually free his slaves unless he's financially provided for him and Washington scrimps and saves for years can, so he can do this. Jefferson's slaves are sold on auction blocks because he's too damn selfish to actually care about them. Okay? So that's what I've come to believe, and that's why uh, my son, you know, I'm glad I didn't name him Jefferson. <laughs> so I'm answering a very straight question, because you see, I thought what you thought when I was your age um, about Jefferson. No, you were kind of, you know, more um, positive about him. The more, I sp more time I spend with Abe Lincoln, the more I admire him. He's not, you know, no one's perfect, but wow. Um, and Jefferson has disappointed me. You're hearing, um, you know, kind of a, you know, um, uh, a lover who 
you know, is, is, is now disappointed when he sees the infidelity, you know, in his beloved. <laughs> okay, what else do you want to ask me? You want to point to the one you yeah, want to please. ask? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Navreet Buddha, and um, it seems like you studied these men a lot, and you really understand them, and from what I understand, these all these men consider themselves to be enlightenment thinkers. And one of the things that I've had a hard time, and I've never really seen a real answer to, is how do these enlightenment thinkers, even when they're enlightenment thinkers, they owned slaves, they had slaves, and they bought and sold slaves. And sure, later in their years, they gave up those slaves, and they used enlightenment ideas to give up those slaves. But do you know how they may have justified? Sure. And I talk about it in the book, so <laughs> Good plug. let's be straight. You know, how many people in this room um, eat animals? You know, how many in this room get, um, uh, uh, are complicit, if you're pro-life, in the, the, the slaughter of um, um, innocent, unborn human life? Complicit in some way. Um, or on the other side, if you are a believer in, in the death penalty, you know, um, are pro-death. You know, from a certain point of view, um, how many of you are allowed, you know, are in all sorts of, of ways contributing to the um, burning up of our planet? Um, it's so easy you know, to, to look back on past figures and say, like, how could they have done that? You know, um, and it's it's way too easy when you're 22 years old. So I'm actually going to tell you, ooh, what will the future think about us? So so that's one. Th so now let me contextualize it. I mentioned it. Very briefly, um, but let me remind you, no society in the history of the world, advanced society, um, um, uh, was uh, um, basically without slavery or forms of unfreedom. The, 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 the indigenous peoples in North America and South America, the Aztecs and um, uh, Incas and Mayas, had forms of unfreedom and, and, and slavery. Um, so, so did... Um, you know, um, Asia, so did all of Europe. To repeat, no society, the only thing that societies had um, were ideas of freeing individual slaves. It's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament, it's, um, I said in Ben-Hur, which is written by Civil War General Lew Wallace, or Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, um, which if you've never seen it, you must. Oh, it, and Sondheim just passed away, is one of Zero Mostel's amazing performances, along with Tevye and Fiddle on the Roof and the producers, but also a great cameo by Buster Keaton. Um, uh, so um, yes, yeah, I mean, great. Um, OK, so the ancient world had the idea of freeing slaves. It did not have the idea of ending slavery. So the question to ask is not how they could think that, because no one sort of thinks about the world from the ground up except a really you know, extraordinary philosophical intellect. You know, you know you, do you think like, like, why do we have gravity? Why does the sun, you know, rise in the east and, and set in the west? Why is the sky blue? Um, uh, so, you know, we just take so much for granted. It's just how the world works, how we've, you know, it's just our, our, our mental furniture. So the extraordinary thing um, is, and it is a tribute to the Enlightenment, um, that they would begin to think, oh, my God, this is... Um, and, and they're religious too. So, oh my God, this is this is um, um, this is sin, um, and, and this is wrong because all men are created. See, that, that's actually a divine reference, you know, um, e um, um, uh, equal. And if we're all really created, and Jefferson, he's a wonderful wordsmith, but he often doesn't really all the way down. He, he loves the soaring prose, but but he but he's a hypocrite too. You see, in, in some ways. So. Um, um, I do not justify what they've done, what they did, but I try to explain it, understand it, because I am an historian and I need to understand. Um, um, so here's what I can tell you. On none of the issues of this early period, the founders are deeply imperfect. I talk about women, slaves, and Native Americans in particular. And I say, you know, it's complicated, but I will say the following. On none of these issues were the British any better than the Americans. In fact, in general, they were worse. And cards on the table, 
in part, I understand that viscerally, because my parents were born in undivided India under the Raj, and let me tell you, the Brits are no saints. So all this stuff that you're hearing about Lord Dunmore and all the rest from Nicole Hannah Jones, it's not quite true, in fact. Um, so how many of you heard Lord Dunmore's proclamation and the 1619? So Lord Dunmore isn't proposing to end slavery. He's proposing to free slaves and only certain slaves, run away slaves from rebel um, slave masters, but not from loyalist slave masters. And Britain has no anti-slavery uh, society in 1775. And Britain's not going to end slavery until 1833. And, and slavery in Barbados is even worse than South Carolina, which, boy, is saying something, because Virginia is heaven compared to South Carolina. Um, and Barbados um, and, and, uh, and the West Indies are even worse. And, and they're British colonies. So. Um, um, and what happens immediately after, because this book doesn't start with the Constitution. I'm starting the story way earlier, not even 1763, end of French and Indian War. 1760 is where I start for certain special reasons. Here's what happens. The American Revolution immediately precipitates abolition in much of the North. Massachusetts gets rid of slavery um, in the 1780 Constitution and 1783 case law, Quack Walker case, Holmes versus Jennison. And, North, and New Hampshire gets rid of slavery. And, and, and um, P Pennsylvania puts slavery on a path of gradual extinction. And New Jersey and Connecticut and New York will do the same. And actually, in the North, the revolution precipitates abolition. In the Deep South, it gets worse, South Carolina. And Virginia is caught in between. And Virginians, a lot of them, are anti-slavery. Um, um, they're like people. Um, they, South Carolinians think slavery is a good thing. Virginians don't. Virginians are smokers who hate smoking and want to quit, but can't, but don't want their grandchildren to start. And this is a tobacco culture and a slave culture. And the two go together. And it's a strip mining culture. And that's called West Virginia. And these things come together because tobacco is bad for the land. It's bad for the air. It's bad for the humans who actually have to produce it. It's, it, it's bad all around, OK? But welcome to Virginia. Um, so um, in the North, we get rid of slavery. In the South, the South Carolinians are doubling down on it. Um, there isn't one America. There are several Americas. We're reading America back in. This is the words that made us because we weren't one thing. We were like the British Commonwealth of Nations in 1930. Well, there's Kenya, there's Canada, there's New Zealand, there's India, um, um, there's Australia. Oh, those are a bunch of different places. Um, final analogy. The, good, the last good war. You'll all say, oh, well, that would, you know, with America, that'd be World War II, because we defeated Hitler. OK? Well, in fact, here's what the Russians believe, that they defeated Hitler. And they did much more of the dying, you know, much more. And good, I'm glad. You know, I, I'd rather that they do the dying, if it's the choice between, you know, them and us. Um, uh, um, and you know how many Russians, Soviets die? 20 million. OK. Um, but here's the thing. We say it's a good war. We allied with one of the, the the most evil, thuggish regimes in the history of human civilization. <coughs> we say, oh, Uncle Joe Stalin, oh, he's, you know. He was not Uncle Joe Stalin, OK? I mean, he was every bit as, as bad as Hitler. But you had to rely on him to defeat Hitler and Mussolini and, 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 and Tojo, OK? And then after that war is over, it's world war. We start to go our separate ways. Patton is seeing this from the beginning. And you're seeing that right now. Well, that's. Massachusetts and South Carolina, and they actually have very different views of the world. They have to join together. It's a world war against Britain, um, and you need allies. Because the, these are the world's first two wars, the French and Indian War, um, uh, which the rest of the world called the Seven Years' War, but we, um, and, and the Revolutionary War, which was another world war. It involved the Dutch, it involved the Spanish, it involved the French, it involved the Brits. Um, there are battles in India. Um, as well as the West Indies. Britain has to keep half its, its troops and fleet at home because they're afraid of a fr French invasion. So in order to win a world war, Massachusetts has to ally with South Carolina. But they are very different in their visions. And that's what you're seeing um, um, in this. But how could enlightened people? I'll tell you one final story. People, people can rationalize all sorts of things. As I mentioned, so I've given, recently I've given up red meat. Okay? But oh, I, I still eat chicken. Really, you know, what did they ever do to me? Um, and and fish, 
you know, they are vertebrates. Okay, here's Franklin on that. He's mocking himself. He's in a Hume, a Hume tradition, Humean, who says, you know, that uh, reason is the slave of the passions. Humans are able to rationalize all sorts of things. So he's telling a story about how he went veg for a while. But he missed the taste of animal flesh. Okay. Um, and, but he thought at first of all it was principled. So then he's on the dock one day in Philadelphia, and they're hauling in a huge shark or something like that, a, 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 a big fish, and they slid it open to clean it, and all these smaller fish come tumbling out of, of the belly. And so he thinks to himself, well, if some fish can eat other fish, they can't really complain if we eat them, can they? Um, and so he goes back to eating animal flesh. Now, he's making fun of himself because he's saying, like, People can rationalize all sorts of stuff, and we do it too. Thank you. Okay, um, at the book signing, I'm happy to talk with you, even if you don't want to buy a book or anything. I'm happy. I'm, I'm still happy to, to to talk to you. I'm sorry I filibustered a little bit too much. My apologies, but but they were such great questions that they invited. I think. Um, you know, um, broad answers. Thank you so much.